Hi everybody, Edith here. How are you? How's your week been? Um, here we are, week two after our inaugural episode last week for this brand new soundtrack and extra YouTube show. Um, I've got to say thank you so much for all your comments, be it on here or on other social media, just real brilliant words of encouragement, which is really nice to hear. And the plan is, is that we're going to bring you a show every week. Um, now, I have a bit of an admission to make straight away in that this show isn't as jam-packed as I would like it to be. And there's a very good and important reason for that. And that's because um, I was in the thick of a wee charity event, a wee live stream that I organised uh, for Masks for Scotland to raise money to buy vital PPE for frontline workers. And it was an incredible night and thanks to everybody who watched, who took part, we raised a huge amount of money uh, that was urgently needed to make sure the PPE arrives in time for the peak that is going to be hitting Scotland soon. So thank you so much uh, to everybody who got involved in the show. Um, it was brilliant. It was so, so great. And I've got a couple of little segments from the show that I want to share with you uh, today in our show. This one, I promise it will be worth the wait. Uh, it's going to feature Jack Loudon with his take on a classic scene from a Scottish film and Peter Mullen using his voice in the most extraordinary way. That's all still to come. But first, Mr. Lenny Abramson, who I am a huge fan of. I love his diversity as a filmmaker, everything from Frank to Room to Little Stranger. Uh, well, he's back with an adaptation of Sally Rooney's Normal People. Uh, and the great thing is that he's worked with the original writer, Sally Rooney, as well as um, Alice Birch, who is an extraordinary writer. Um, so he's directed half the series. Uh, the other half has been directed by Hetty MacDonald. And composing duties, as always, is with his longtime collaborator, Mr Stephen Rennix. Now, you can hear Lenny and I talk in much more detail on this week's uh, soundtrack and podcast episode. We go into great detail about working with Stephen again and also how, for the first time properly, Lenny has gone for using a lot of needle drops. So there's a lot of original music in Normal People. Um, and the series has got uh, 10 episodes and it drops, all of them drop this Sunday, which is the 26th of April on the BBC iPlayer. Normal People, Lenny Bramson. It was an absolute treat to catch up with the man. It was different with you. I didn't have to play any games, it was just real. I would have done anything you wanted me to. Anyway. How are you? Do you think about me at night? When the sky is losing a light I swear my head fills up with men used to hook up secretly. Secretly? That's cool. That's actually really hot. I don't tell anybody in school about this. Like I talk to anyone at school. I'm never lonely when I'm with you. Tell me why this has to be this heavy. You try to act like your friends. But you know you're not that kind of person. Excuse me. I feel like I'm walking around trying on a hundred different versions of myself. And how do you know what you want? Most of the time, I don't have a clue. You must know what you feel. Do your friends know about us? No. I feel like everything's changed. You don't want to touch me, but you get to dictate who else does. They don't really think that's what's going on here. What is it, then? I did used to think that I could read your mind at times. I don't know, maybe that's normal. It's not. I watched, I've watched four episodes of yes. uh, Normal People. The look of it, the the casting of it, the sound of it, the shots. Oh, it's just beautiful. Congratulations. Uh, thank you so much. I, you know what? It's so funny because the bet, the two, the, my favorite episode probably is F5. So you're, you're, you're about to see that. It's the real, it's the one where you get to feel just like pleasure from the start to the finish, you know? Um, before things go tits up again. In, in <laughs> I guess this is a bit of a first for you, though, isn't it, in terms of of a, a series for TV? Yes, I did years ago with Marco Halloran, who I made uh, two films, Adam Paul and Garage, with. We yeah. did a series for RT called Prosperity, which was like very different and, and, and sort of still 
like in the old days of television before streaming and and all this sort of revolution but it's been a long long time and to do something yeah of this sort of profile and and reach and everything it it does feel like a, a new thing for me with this book being the kind of the phenomenon that it was as well does that do you try and not think about that when you're going into it or how, how do you kind of is this do you approach like a brand new thing almost yeah i mean when we when we uh, first read it so ed guiney had read it and ed who i worked with yeah produced everything and is just you know an amazing part of uh my life in that way and um element pictures and andrew lowe his partner um Ed said, look, this is amazing, this book. And and I'd read Conversations and loved it. And um, and he, he, he said, read Normal People. At that point, it hadn't been published. So the first time I read it, oh, you know, wow. there was an awful lot of buzz about it. And yeah. We knew that there was very, like, lots of people wanted it to make it into a piece of either television or film. Like, so it was a, there was already a lot of people circling it. But it hadn't, it, it hadn't become the thing that it became, you know, where you couldn't get on the tube without seeing five people reading it or, you know every time you open social media somebody's yeah. talking about it um so in that sense I read I had a very pure read the first time and I absolutely just loved it mm, yeah um and but I think close to the end of the and then you just get so sucked into the process like there's no time to think about you just want to make not wreck it and you just want to make you know get through the process like er, always without catastrophe that's the feeling I always have when when I'm making something it's just the pressure of it but then at the end I think you start to think again especially given what happened to the book you think oh god yeah <laughs> I, hope, I, I hope people don't feel that you've damaged some beloved you know you've 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 done something horrible to a family member of theirs but, <laughs> uh, but you you also I suppose there is that thing you know where uh you have to trust yourself and trust the process and we had two such amazing actors and I you just could not when I got them together for the first time and then we started to work and rehearse and then shoot, couldn't look at it and go, Ooh, I wonder whether this is good or not. You could feel it. Yeah. And and actually, you know, there's a really interesting thing that happens. So I've talked about this with people, close people recently, which is that oddly, when you read a book, um, lots of people form a very definite mental picture of what the characters look like, right? Yeah. And they, they've got to be all different because, you know, everybody's imagination is different. Yeah. And and there is some description in Sally's book, but it's she's not like, she doesn't layer it up with loads of descriptions of what they look like. So it's very open to imagine. And yet, when you put, if you cast right, and if the essential kind of quality of the character is, is preserved, it's amazing how many people afterwards will say, that's exactly how I imagine them. That was nice. <laughs> All right, what are you laughing for? Nothing. Well, you're acting like you've never been kissed before. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> uh, I don't tell anybody in school about this, okay? Like I talk to anyone at school. <laughs> So that was just a, a little clip of Lenny and I chatting. Um, unfortunately, it was just audio. So apologies for the random pictures that were over that, some of which I took on set for uh, Little Stranger. 
uh, which was his last film that starred Donald Gleason. Anyway, I digress. Uh, make sure you check out the series that is going to be on the iPlayer as of this Sunday, the 26th of April, and it's brilliant. It's really, really, really good. So on Wednesday night, um, with the help of some brilliant people, uh, I put on a four hour live stream to raise money for Masks for Scotland. Uh, an amazing collection of well-known faces uh, from the world of film, from TV, from comedy, from literature, all came together to raise spirits, to raise money and share stories of thanks and gratitude. Now, uh, some came in for a wee chat, some people sung a wee song, some people did comedy, some people made videos for us. Uh, and I really wanted someone to do a bedtime story. Uh, and that job was given and gladly accepted by Mr. Peter Mullen. It needs no other introduction apart from, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Peter Mullen. Bedtime story, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Once upon a time, there were three bears who lived together in a house of their own in a wood. One of them was a little small wee bear. One was a middle-sized bear, and the other a great huge bear. They each had a bowl for the porridge, a little bowl for the little small wee bear, a middle-sized bowl for the middle-sized bear, and a great huge bowl for the great huge bear. And they each had a chair to sit in, a little chair for the little small wee bear, a middle-sized chair for the middle-sized bear, and a great huge chair for the great huge bear. And they each had a bed to sleep in. A little bed for the little small wee bear, middle-sized bed for the middle-sized bear, and a great huge bed for the great huge bear. One day, after they'd made their porridge for breakfast and poured it into the porridge bowls, they walked out into the woods while the porridge was cooling. And while they were walking, a little girl named Goldilocks came to their house. First, she looked in the windows, then she peeped in at the keyhole, and seeing no one was there, she lifted the latch. The door opened before her, and in she went. How pleased Goldilocks was when she saw the steaming porridge on the table. The sweet smell of the porridge with roasted nuts, honey, and berries filled the room. It was so tempting that Goldilocks set about helping herself. First, she tasted the porridge of the great huge bear, but it was too hot. Then she tasted the porridge of the middle-sized bear, but it was too cold. And then she tried the porridge of the little small wee bear, and it was neither too hot nor too cold. It was just right. She liked it so much that she ate it all up. Then Goldilocks sat down in the chair of the great huge bear, but it was too hard for her. Then she sat down in the chair of the middle-sized bear, but it was too soft for her. And then she sat down in the chair of the little small wee bear, and this chair was neither too hard nor too soft. It was just right. So Goldilocks seated herself in it, and there she sat until the bottom of the chair gave way, and down she came, plump, upon the floor. It says plump. I don't know why it says plump. Plump's a stupid name to describe somebody falling through a chair. Um, I'm going to offer up oofed. Oofed upon the floor. It's a better word. Then Goldilocks went upstairs to the bedroom in which the three bears slept. First, she lay down upon the bed of the great huge bear, but that was too high at the head for her. Next, she lay down upon the bed of the middle-sized bear, but that was too high at the foot for her. Then she lay down upon the bed of the little small wee bear, and that was neither too high at the head nor foot, but just right. So she covered herself up comfortably and fell fast asleep. But this time, the three bears thought their porridge would be cool enough to eat, so they returned home for breakfast. Now Goldilocks had left the spoon of the great huge bear standing in his porridge. Somebody has been in my porridge, said the great huge bear in his great rough, gruff voice. And when the middle-sized bear looked at hers, she saw that the spoon was standing in it too. Somebody has been at my porridge, said the middle-sized bear in her middle, slightly middle-class voice. 
Then the little small wee bear looked at his bowl and the spoon was in the porridge bowl, but the porridge was all gone. Somebody has been at my porridge and has eaten it all up, said the little small wee bear in his little small wee lightly whiny voice. Upon this, the three bears, seeing that someone had entered the house and eaten up little small wee bear's breakfast, began to look about them. Now Goldilocks had not put the hard cushion straight when she rose from the chair of the great huge bear. Somebody has been sitting on my chair, said the great huge bear in his great gruff voice. And Goldilocks had crumpled the soft cushion of the middle-sized bear. Somebody has been sitting in my chair said the middle-sized bear in her middle, slightly asthmatic voice. And you know what Goldilocks had done to the third chair? Somebody has been sitting in my chair and has sat the bottom right of it, said the little, small, wee bear in his wee, small, and still slightly whingy voice. Then the bears thought it necessary that they should, should make a further search, search so they went upstairs to the bedroom. Now Goldilocks had pulled the pillow of the great huge bear out of its place. Somebody has been sleeping in my bed, said the great huge bear in his great rough voice. And Goldilocks had pulled the cover of the middle-sized bear out of its place. Somebody, somebody has been lying in my bed, said the middle-sized bear in a middle-class asthmatic voice. And then the little small wee bear came to look at the bed. There was Goldilocks, sleeping peacefully in a long shiny braid spread across a pillow. Little small wee bear just stared at her for a moment and said nothing. But then he cried. Somebody has been lying in my bed and here she is. Goldilocks had heard in her sleep the great rough, gruff voice of the great huge bear and the middle voice of the middle-sized bear, but it was only as if she'd heard someone speaking in a dream. But when she heard the little small wee voice of the little small, small, small wee bear, it was so sharp and so shrill and so like her own that it awakened her at once. Up she started. And when she saw the three bears on one side of the bed, she tumbled herself out of the other and ran to the window. Out Goldilocks jumped and ran away as fast as she could run, not looking behind her until she was very far away. And what happened to Goldilocks afterwards? No one can tell. But the three bears never saw anything more of her. The end. Told you, Peter Mullen reading Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You didn't know that you needed it, but now that you have it, very glad that you have it in your life. Uh, I've got another little clip for you coming up from Wednesday night's mammoth uh, charity live stream that raised a huge amount of money uh, that was needed urgently for Masks for Scotland to buy PPE. Uh, next up, Mr Ricky Gervais, who is back with uh, Afterlife Series 2. And the first series had a huge impact, really, really important. And, and Ricky's never one to shy away from addressing and talking about subjects that most people would kind of shy away from. And he does that once again in this fantastic second series. Um, again, I'm just going to share a little clip with you uh, for Ricky and I talking. You can hear the full chat or most of the full chat on next week's episode of Soundtrack and Podcast, uh, where we talk a lot about the music, working again with the wonderful Andy Burrows on the score. And as usual, he uses quite a lot of needle drops as well. So you can hear that kind of full extended chat with all the music on the podcast next Friday. Um, but for now, um, here's a little clip of Ricky and I chatting about series two of Afterlife. Congratulations on the second series. Um, Thank you. I, uh, I, I, I loved it. I mean, I just love these characters. They're just, the truth in this, in this series is just extraordinary. And I think that, that that flows across so many of the characters as well. And, and more so, I think, in the second series than the first. You know, it's obviously Tony's story, but in this series, I feel that we really get more kind of sort of insight into a lot more of the characters and, and where yeah. they are. 
Was that was that a deliberate thing for you? Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, a second series is great because you hit the ground running. People know the characters. You don't have to explain them. You don't have to explain the situation. You know, you, and, and particularly when it's a binge watch and it, it, it goes next to the the last six. You you know you you can tell a story. So I, I treat each series now like a sort of like a novel or a double movie. You know, it, it's it's just the right length to get in and out and um, and tell the story. Uh, but yeah, I love I love all the characters and because they're such great comedy actors and performers as well. There's about six to ten characters that could be the lead in a sitcom. Mm. That you know, it's it's so much fun working with these people. But you hit the nail on the head. It's sort of truth, and by that I mean there's a realism to it. And people sometimes think, oh, it's harsh. And I want to go, well, no, that's just real. The world is harsh, you know, or, uh, God, they're all, they're all freaks. No, 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 they're normal. <laughs> yeah. ER, ER is a bunch of freaks because people <laughs> don't look that good. So when they see something like this on telly, like that, they go, whoa, that's not, no, let me, let's walk around England. M more people look like me and David Earl and, you know, than look like yeah. George Clooney. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just real, you know, and and things are mucked up, you know. People do say terrible things when they're good people, if they're hurt. And uh, and there's, I like the ambiguity and the surprise, and and that that everyone's everyone's surprising. You you really can't judge a book by the cover because everyone's got their own story. And what I learned from after series one went out, I never had a reaction like it. And um, yeah. I don't mean the size of the reaction because that's a reflection of Netflix having, I don't know, 170 million subscribers and I'm on, I'm on social media. But it was different. Uh, for a start, my agent got 300 letters the first week. Now that's rare. I get a bit of fan mail, but I don't get letters. You know, no one yeah. writes letters anymore. And it was all about their story of grief. And people come out to me on the street, they usually go, love the show, or like to do one so-and-so, I saw you. But they, now they came out and said, just want to say, um, I lost my brother last year and and they tell their their story so I, I think things like this people are worried about putting out something like this because i think you know can people at home take it it's very dark i mean it starts with a a, a woman dying of cancer knowing she's dying leaving a funny list you know and this man is watching it it's heartbreaking but people are people are braver than we think i don't know why we're worried about what people at home can take in fiction mm. because the real world's more scary. Absolutely. It's more scary. And we second guess people and go, oh, they can't take all that swearing. Have you walked around <laughs> a, a building site or a playground and heard My swearing? mom's kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just think that I, it, it's this myth that people at home turn things off and they go, no, that was, the, the language was a bit harsh or <laughs> yeah. depressing or, People go towards it. They go towards it because we create our own heroes and villains as role play for the soul. So people go through this gamut of emotions and no one really gets hurt. And I think that's that sort of fiction at its best, really. It takes mm. you through those emotions for real. And you can relate to so much of it as well, you know, whether you've you've lost someone or you've you've been there to support someone or trying to talk someone through a huge loss in that grief process as well. And but then also, I mean, there's a particular moment in um, episode five, which is the um, the kind of review show that's going on at the town hall, which is an extraordinary an extraordinary thing to watch for so many reasons yeah. and i've been i've been in the crowd of many of those that's yeah. the, <laughs> that's the but truth that's what's of it. sweet about life I, I think i think like at the moment people didn't know they'd miss the mundane they miss the mundane you know just just going into shops when you have no you have no intention of buying anything <laughs> but you know what i mean it's like because you can't you know, <laughs> you can. And, and this 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 series is about that that how the mundane how chores save your life you know he had to feed the dog so he didn't kill himself you know he 
he has to go to work to get enough money to get drunk or whatever. So, and all those little things, um, it, 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 those stories he covers, they, they save his life, they're distractions and they're worth it because everyone's got a story. And uh, there's, a, there's a line in series one where my brother-in-law says, what, you've just come to realize that other people have got problems too. And that shows up that Tony's a bit selfish as well and he's a bit spoiled. And everyone thinks what they're going through is worse. Everyone thinks, no, my thing's the worst. And there's that thing that if everyone got together and put their troubles in a, in a hat, they'd end up and experience the other troubles. They'd end up wanting to take their own troubles home with them. And, and that's true. And uh, Matt says to him, so next time you try and get a waitress fired because your soup's cold, remember, she might have just found out her mum's got cancer. And I think that really sums up uh, Tony's journey, that we're all a bit spoiled sometimes. We all go through grief and we all feel sad, but other people are grieving too. And I think that's what, and, and that, and in a weird way, helping people makes you feel better you know i, I think there's a it's a wonderful life it starts with yeah. an angel jumping in so the man who's going to commit suicide has to save his life i think that's a metaphor for living with people i think it's i think that's so beautiful and so real that um you know the angel has to say no 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 i saved your life and it's, it's just, it's just lovely. Every road that you go down, every turning of the crowd, you should know that I'll be with you. People think all those things I miss doing with Lisa, I could just do them anyway. They're missing the point. I miss doing nothing with Lisa. Be strong. Everybody's struggling. It's not always their fault. The last thing you should do is drink alone. When she died, everyone tried to help me and they sort of saved me. I feel that I should help the people who helped me. What did you do that for? You look sad. Right. Oh, that's a waste. I know a guy who's really into you. What's wrong with him? Can I just use your bathroom? Honestly, I, I don't know where to start. Fuck me. I thought you were having a piss. Thought we'd have a wash. Fucking hell. I'm not gonna let arseholes find me out. Try to be more zen. Hear that? Shine your heart forward. Fuck that. How is that relaxing? It's disgusting. See you next Tuesday. You're not wrong there. we go series two of afterlife is on netflix now available for you guys to uh, completely dive into and it's it's great and that scene that we talk about as well in particular the scene from the um kind of variety show in the town hall oh right i'm gonna leave you with another clip from uh, our wednesday live stream that we had up on um actually just before that a couple of albums that i wanted to draw your attention to um, some great stuff out there at the minute for and another thing as well that we we're talking about Wednesday night is how the situation that we find ourselves in it's given us the time to kind of maybe listen to new things watch new things but also dive back into our, our libraries of books and music and DVDs to find things that we'd kind of forgotten about and I did that with Rachel Sermani who was an artist that was on the stream with us this uh, last week. She's a fantastic Scottish artist. So if you fancy a tip on someone new, Rachel Sermani, beautiful, the most stunning, gorgeous, beautiful songwriter. Oh, and it was so great to hear her perform live. Um, but Laura Marling's new record is also out and it's great and it's brilliant and you should try and listen to it start to finish. It's almost like you read a book. It's very, very good, as is Fiona Apples. So there's a couple of musical tips for you. 
Um, but we're going to finish this week's show. We'll be back next week with loads more stuff. It'll be rammed with things, I promise. But we're going to leave you with this um, video from Mr. Jack Loudon, who's the reason I did the stream last week anyway, because he sent me a message after he saw what a few people were doing in Wales. And he's like, we should do something like this for Scotland. So I was like, do you know what? Let's do it. So thanks to Jack for encouraging me to do it. And thanks to Jack for this video. Um, he is isolating somewhere in Perthshire. And he managed to record this on his phone and cut it together. And it's his version of the famous uh, Choose Life speech from Irvin Welsh's and Danny Boyle's train spotting uh, done in a brilliant way. And so I thought I'd leave this uh, end the show this week with this from Jack Loudon. Uh, huge thanks to him. Huge thanks to you. Make sure you subscribe to the show. There'll be a little button for you to click as well and check out all the other stuff as well that we have on our soundtrack and extra YouTube page. And I'll see you next week for another version. In the meantime as well, you can listen to this week's podcast with Mr. Lenny Bramison. Take care. Be safe. Choose life. Choose your future. Choose staying at home. Choose good health. Choose rubber gloves. Choose swapping your favourite smell and perfume for the clinical musk of antibacterial gel. <laughs> Choose watching every box set under the sun until your remote controls your best friend. Choose waking up on a Sunday morning and not knowing who the hell you are. Choose not even knowing if it's a Sunday morning. Choose to do copious amounts of yoga, home workouts, Zumba, online daily tango lessons. Choose finally writing that novel you've always said you'd write and actually probably never will. Choose washing your hands every single day of your life like you probably should have been doing anyway. Choose bacon, choose plain flour, choose sourdough, choose rye bread, choose finally finding out what in actual Christ's name does art as an actually mean. Choose trying a new hairstyle, choose a side part and middle part and absolutely nay part. Choose locking yourself in the cupboard to get five minutes peace from the bored noisy bairns you spawn to replace yourself. Choose exploring the wonderful possibilities of self-socialising. Choose talking to every single one of your friends at exactly the same time like you never ever do in real life. Choose going outside but staying strictly two metres apart as if you're absolutely raging at everyone. Janet, back off. And why would I want to do all that stuff? The reasons? There are no reasons. Who needs reasons when you've got to protect their NHS? You absolute spoon. Oh